afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to welcome all of you to our closing panel. I'm Lee Liberman Otis. Uh, I was one of the founders of the Federalist Society. I'm now the senior vice president of the Federalist Society. And uh, I'm not a movie, so I apologize for not being a movie because that's how we've started most of our showcase panels. But I'll do my best to be an imitation of a movie anyway. Um, I wanted to say a few words about Justice Scalia uh, because basically uh, he was so integral to the Federalist Society's formation and uh, about our long 35-year uh, relationship with the, with the justice. I first met Justice Scalia back in 1981 when I was a law student and he was a law professor at the University of Chicago. My classmate, David McIntosh, and I had this crazy notion that there should be a student organization in Chicago that took seriously some of the ideas about law that President Reagan had discussed during the election. We'd been discussing this with our friend from college, Stephen Calabresi, who was also interested in starting such a group at Yale and who uh, having a great feel for um, uh, naming things, uh, thought that it should be named the Federalist Society. So we decided to steal the name that he came up with for our group at Chicago. Unlike the situation at any other top school at Chicago at the time, there were a lot of astonishingly smart professors we might have asked to serve as our faculty advisor for this project. But we decided on Professor Scalia. Professor Scalia was actually visiting at Stanford at the time, so I called him up with some trepidation and asked him if he'd be willing to do this. I also told him about the group at Yale and that we were thinking we might have a symposium there that both our groups might sponsor. Professor Scalia responded with characteristic enthusiasm. He suggested several foundations where, that we might approach to seek funding, he reeled off a list of people that we should invite to the symposium, and he pointed us to some students at Stanford who were also trying to start a group there. We concluded we'd pick the right guy. <laughs> After law school, I clerked for judge and then Justice Scalia. I was in Justice Scalia's second class of clerks on the DC circuit and his first class of clerks at the Supreme Court. During my clerkship, Justice Scalia attended a celebration in honor of Justice Brennan's 80th birthday. Justice Brennan's clerks had put together a display of all of his most important opinions. Justice Scalia walked into the room, looked around, and without missing a beat, quipped, so little time, so much to overrule. <laughs> <laughs> Justice Scalia was one of the greatest legal thinkers, analysts, and writers ever to sit on the high court, and also a warm, generous man with a wonderful sense of humor, occasionally perhaps just a little too good. Yet his most important and enduring contribution was, as my former student, Daniel Sir, wrote, to be a kind of modern judicial Cincinnatus. He deployed his gifts not to use the law to, to accomplish his own policy objectives, but to reestablish the view of the Constitution as a form of law, that its meaning, like that of other legal texts, is knowable, that understanding its meaning starts with reading what it says, and that it's the job of judges to read it, figure out, and follow it. Back when Justice Scalia first joined the high court, law school professors and justices almost uniformly believed that no person of even ordinary intelligence could hold such a naive view. Rather, they proclaimed that the Constitution's meaning was largely indeterminate and that the justices themselves created its meaning. Justice Scalia changed this dramatically when one of the nation's most powerful intellects and one of the greatest writers ever to sit on the Supreme Court, took the view that the Constitution was a law, when he made arguments based on the Constitution's original meaning, and when he demolished arguments based on other considerations, the impact was huge. It changed the entire legal conversation. The idea that the Constitution and other laws are knowable and binding on judges 
and justices is the foundation for rescuing the entire legal and constitutional enterprise. Because if the Constitution or other laws have no intrinsic meaning and are just whatever the judges say they are, how can anyone follow them? And why should they? All of us who worked with Justice Scalia, his clerks, his friends, and his colleagues on the court miss him terribly. But as we do so, we should reflect on his crucial legacy, reviving for the modern era a way to understand the Constitution that takes it seriously as a legal document. Like the Republic, the Constitution's framers gave us, this legacy is ours if we can keep it. And now I would like to turn things over to one of those who is working very hard and has worked tirelessly on guarding this legacy, uh, Judge Diarmado Scanlon of the Ninth Circuit. Thank you very much, Lee. It is a privilege to kick off this roundtable conversation discussing the legacy of Justice Antonin Scalia. I ask you to visualize a round table. This isn't quite round, but we have decided we are going to participate in this conversation from our seated positions. Justice Elena Kagan observed in a talk at Harvard last fall, and I quote, the truth of the matter is that if you wake up in 100 years, most people are not going to know most of our names. But that is not the case with Justice Scalia, end quote. I was honored to call Justice Scalia a friend, and I attended his funeral at the Basilica. There were thousands of mourners there to pay their respects. The Basilica is the largest Catholic church in North America and one of the 10 largest religious shrines in the entire world. But what struck me was the hundreds of thousands, even perhaps millions more, watching the funeral on live television. The enormous crowd was an eloquent testament to the incre incredible impact Justice Scalia had on the law and on the country as a whole. Justice Kagan is absolutely correct. This afternoon, we have a superb panel to discuss that impact, specifically the areas of constitutional doctrine that Justice Scalia helped transform. Joining us is Floyd Abrams, First Amendment specialist and partner with the Cahill Gordon and Reindell Law Firm in New York. Judge Michael McConnell, professor and director of the Constitutional Law Center at Stanford Law School. Nadine Strawson, former president of the ACLU and current professor at New York Law School. Eugene Volokh, professor at UCLA School of Law. Justice David Strauss of the Minnesota Supreme Court and Ed Whalen, president of the Ethics and Public Policy Center and a former law clerk to Justice Scalia. Let's begin with an opening round, let's say four minutes apiece, to highlight each area that the individual members of the panel have agreed to focus on, after which we can expand into a broader discussion. To get the conversations going, Floyd, why don't we start with you? What can you tell us about Justice Scalia's approach to free speech issues? Maybe I can put it uh, in a way that uh, he did to Nadine and myself. Some years ago, uh, we were in London. Uh, he had just given a speech on international law uh, to a group of uh, lawyers from around the world, mostly English, but not limited to that, in which he enjoyed himself greatly by saying there wasn't any such thing really, and in any event, we wouldn't apply it. Uh, and uh, that they were duly shocked 
as he intended. Uh, in any event, after that, uh, he came out, and uh, Nadine and I, who did not, uh, I suppose I'd say present tense, do not uh, share the sort of political social views that Justice Scalia had about uh, much of the world, uh, but he was someone who had friends, let me say, who did not agree with him uh, on social, political, even juridical matters. But we sat and talked about a case uh, called uh, uh, the, uh, a, a case in which, to put it this way, the Supreme Court, over a very strong dissent by Justice Scalia, had upheld a statute which effectively banned any corporate contributions uh, of a political sort, uh, independent expenditures, the same issue that would arise years later uh, in Citizens United. Uh, and Nadine and I uh, were both uh, appalled by the majority uh, opinion of Justice Stevens and very admiring of Justice Scalia, so therefore we were all in a very good mood, uh, all, all agreeing with each other, had a few drinks, he had a few cigars, and he sat back and he said, you know, I'm not really bad about the First Amendment. <laughs> uh, 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 and he wasn't, uh, even from the perspective of people who might not agree with him on a lot of other things. Uh, it's, it's true that he was heard to say more than once uh, that New York Times versus Sullivan could not exactly withstand an originalist uh, test, uh, but he didn't do anything about that uh, as, a, as a jurist. And then some areas, uh, sexual, for example, sexual depictions and the like, uh, he was not uh, terribly libertine uh, in, in his opinions. But as a general proposition, I would say, he was one of the most protective jurists uh, to sit on the Supreme Court and one whose opinions will have an enduring character uh, because uh, not only of the power of his intellect, but the power of his writing. Uh, very few jurists have written with the, with the passion uh, and the, the beauty that Justice Scalia did. And I would cite to you three opinions of his in particular that I recommend to you. Uh, one, and my favorite, is his dissenting opinion in Austin versus Michigan Chamber of Commerce, an opinion disapproved by the court in Citizens United years later, uh, and that's the one that I referred to earlier. Uh, it's a dissenting opinion which starts out as no other opinion that I know of in the court's history. The first words were as follows, in quotation marks, attention all citizens <laughs> to assure the fairness of elections by preventing the disproportionate expression of views of any single powerful group, your government has decided that the following association of persons shall be prohibited from speaking or writing in favor of any candidate. <laughs> wow. You know, <laughs> I mean, now that, that happens to be an opinion which changed my mind about this subject. And one of the paragraphs, I'm not just going to be reading to you, but when I just have four minutes, <laughs> but, but I, I, I did want to read to you just three lines from a, a later part of that opinion. He said, the court, uh, the majority opinion of, of Justice Marshall, does not try to defend the proposition that independent advocacy poses a substantial risk of political corruption as English speakers, a great phrase, as English speakers use that term, Rather, it asserts that concept is really just a narrow subspecies of a hitherto unrecognized genus of political corruption. Michigan's regulation, we're told, aims at a different type of corruption, the corrosive and distorting effect of immense aggregations of wealth, etc. Under this mode of analysis, virtually anything the court views politically undesirable can be turned into political corruption. 
And now listen to this phrase. By simply describing its effects as politically corrosive, which is close enough to corruption to qualify. <laughs> it, is, it is sad to think that the First Amendment will ultimately be brought down by brute, not by brute force, but by poetic metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> but let me say something. Law clerks don't write like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would cite just two other cases to you, which I urge you to have a look at. His dissenting opinion in Hill versus Colorado, another case later effectively rejected by the court, although it couldn't bring itself to say so, uh, <coughs> in the McCollum case about uh, commentary statements, uh, efforts to persuade women going to abortion clinics in a non-threatening way, in a non-blocking way uh, from getting to those clinics, which the majority of the court held was constitutional, a similar statute much more recently was held unconstitutional, but an extremely powerful, extremely powerful and a beautiful piece of literature and finally, the much more recent case in Brown versus EMS, which dealt with video games in California, which struck down a California statute, which, which uh, would make it a crime for people under a certain age to buy video games, uh, in, in which, uh, again, uh, he really gave vent to his overview, his extremely broad, sweepingly protective view of the First Amendment. So what he leaves behind uh, is a body of opinions, and I couldn't possibly go through all the different areas, but a body of First Amendment opinions, which for the most part have become First Amendment law, which are very protective uh, and enduring. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, turning to the religion clauses, Justice Scalia grappled with both the free exercise and the establishment clause. Professor McConnell, uh, what can you tell us about Justice Scalia's approach to these clauses? Uh, I don't think there is another area of important constitutional doctrine that got changed as dramatically uh, during, uh, partly as a result of Justice Scalia's work and, and during his tenure on the court. Uh, when he arrived at the Supreme Court in the mid-1980s, the two halves of the religion clauses, the establishment half and the free exercise half, uh, were, the, the court sort of politely said that they were in tension with each other. Uh, a more candid analysis would say that the way that they had been interpreted made them opposites of each other. The reigning case under the Establishment Clause was Lemon versus Kurtzman uh, that held that a school, uh, the, if a school is religious, then it cannot receive government aid uh, to which it would otherwise be entitled. Uh, and the reason for that is the government may not advance religion. Uh, on the reigning case, the leading case under the Free Exercise Clause was Sherbert against Verner, uh, which held that if a person was unemployed on account of religious exercise, it is unconstitutional to deny them the benefit to which they would otherwise uh, be entitled uh, on the ground that any time the government imposes a penalty or a burden, including not uh, de denying an otherwise uh, available benefit, uh, that that is a presumptive violation of the Free Exercise Clause. Now, I hope I'm not speaking too quickly, but you will appreciate that those are exactly opposite uh, holdings. And, and, and let me put it uh, uh, perhaps exaggeratedly simply, uh, that special protection for religion advances religion, and denial of benefits uh, penalizes religion, which means that under the court's interpretation as Justice Scalia came to the court, the free exercise clause itself violates the establishment clause, <laughs> and the establishment clause itself violates the free exercise clause. Now we lawyers, especially we appellate lawyers, 
are attentive to the existence of splits among the circuits as being an important occasion for the Supreme Court to come in and clarify what the law is. Let me tell you, splits among the clauses <laughs> are an even more uh, uh, worthy of, of Supreme Court clarification. And indeed, in the coming years, uh, uh, led by Justice Scalia, both halves of the religion clauses were, uh, uh, were altered so that in uh, the in employment division against Smith, and I should just uh, footnote, he, uh, Justice Scalia uh, flattered me by saying that I was the leading academic critic of this decision, so uh, don't uh, necessarily misunderstand what I'm saying, but uh, in employment division against Smith, uh, the court held that neutral and generally applicable laws do not violate the free exercise clause, and in a series of decisions culminating in, in uh, uh, the Zellman, uh, Simmons uh, Harris versus Zellman case, the Cleveland voucher case, the court has held that neutral and generally applicable benefits may include religious institutions without violating the establishment clause. In other words, both clauses require neutrality with respect to religion, and it makes them entirely uh, uh, compatible. Uh, it was a sea change, and it has, even though, again, I am a critic of part of that uh, uh, holding, uh, it, has create, it has changed an area of the law which, which was uh, internally at war with itself into one which is uh, clear, consistent, and easily understandable. Thank you, Judge. Professor Strawson, the First Amendment is such a broad topic. What other aspects of Justice Scalia's First Amendment rulings do you think are especially noteworthy beyond those that uh, Mr. Abrams and Professor McConnell have discussed? Since Floyd was uh, so good as to reminisce about a wonderful drink and cigar sharing <laughs> and uh, First Amendment swapping uh, evening with Justice Scalia, I just want to chime in because um, all of us were good friends and we were in, in London for various reasons. I, Scalia had given the keynote address that night for a conference on international human rights, basically as Floyd saying, uh, said, taking the point that there's the perspective that there should be no such thing because, you know, we need rules and we need standards and we need firm laws and international human rights is too loosey-goosey. And I was giving the rebuttal the next day. Um, so at that time, and I just don't know if this is still true, at that, and this was, the conference was taking place in a hotel in London and we were meeting in the bar in the hotel afterwards for our drinks and cigars. And um, at the time, London hotels had an extraordinarily strict rule that unless you were guest at the hotel after 11 p.m., you were not allowed to buy drinks. And so the bartender, we wanted our second round of cognac. We were still smoking our cigars and chatting away. Uh, and the bartender came up very strictly, said, it's an absolute rule. And, you know, we had an excellent advocate here. Floyd Abrams tried to persuade him to make an exception. And, uh, you know, I said, see, Nino, see where you get with rules without discretion. Uh, <laughs> I, I have to tell you one other little thing, because I feel so proud. I became the advocate for these two giant intellects uh, of the bar. Uh, uh, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I took it upon myself to approach some uh, gentleman sitting at the bar to ask whether he was a hotel guest and would buy the drinks and we would uh, reimburse them. So I went up to the first man I saw sitting at the bar and I said, sir, are you a guest at this hotel? And he said, yes, honey, and I have a king-size bed. <laughs> oh, but, but it wasn't me. 
So I um, had the opportunity this summer to read a book, which I'm sure all of you will uh, really appreciate. It hasn't been published yet by Cambridge University Press. Uh, a biography, of, not a biography, an analysis of just, it was called The Liberal Opinions of Justice Scalia, written by David Dorson, who was his law school classmate and on the Harvard Law Review with him and a very good friend of his. And um, it was a, it's an excellent book. David makes a contention that I know has been opposed by others, including Randy Barnett. I'm an agnostic on the point. I'm not enough of an expert. But David's conclusion is that Scalia did consistently apply originalism, even in cases where the policy, his own policy perspective, was at odds with what the, his originalist approach, uh, where, it, where it led him. Um, and one example I think that we're all familiar with is, it wasn't his opinion, but it was his vote. And that was very important in Texas versus Johnson. Um, the flag burning case uh, decided five to four, so his vote was outcome determinative. He was fairly new on the court at that point, and I think it was a hard decision for him because on the one hand, you had the text of the Constitution, but on the other hand, you had tradition, uh, which was very important to him. And by the way, in terms of his personal opposition, uh, he uh, said, I, if I were king, I would put in jail every sandal-wearing, scruffy-bearded weirdo who burns the American flag. So <laughs> we know it was co completely against his, uh, his personal preferences. Now, um, w right after that decision was issued, he and I, and we became friends because we debated each other all over the world, literally. I think the most uh, faraway place we did that was, was New Zealand. And we always had a good time, uh, agreed very strongly on some issues, disagreed very strongly on others. Uh, so very soon after this, the Texas versus Johnson came out, he and I were doing a debate on, on Michael's issues where we strongly disagreed, uh, in my case, with both of his positions on, on both of the religion clauses. At, this was at the Jewish Theological Seminary uh, on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Um, now, I don't know how much any of you know about that neighborhood, but it is extremely liberal. Uh, at that point, um, we had actually just elected a dead Democrat to Congress. I mean, had recently died, but nobody could still bring themselves to vote for anybody else uh, in that neighborhood. <laughs> a lot of dead voters, too. So. <laughs> So, uh, so we we do this debate about the religion clauses of the Constitution of the First Amendment, and then the very first question, this woman stands up and she is so. Oh, I have to tell you one other thing. So Scalia, when he's talking about the importance of tradition, this was so cute in this audience. He actually started singing tradition. Yeah, I can't do it, and and dancing like from Fiddler on the Roof. <laughs> But the very first question was this woman who stands up, and she is so irate about his vote in Texas versus Johnson. How could he possibly uphold that freedom of speech? And he's going like this. He said, I can't believe this. Here I am in the most liberal neighborhood in the whole country, and I'm being accused of being too liberal. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think I'm probably almost out of time, but I want to say something about uh, the very important issues that, that Michael touched on. And, you know, in some ways it's so interesting that Justice Scalia was also voting against personal interest with respect to um, the Smith decision. And I was, uh, a, as he did with, res I mean, he couldn't vote at the time, but uh, he was very, very critical of one of the court's first substantive due process cases, Pierce versus Society of Sisters, about the right to send your kids to parochial school, which he obviously chose to exercise and, and benef benefited from nine times over. But um, he did make a separation uh, very strictly, again, between his policy preferences and um, and, and, and constitutional interpretation. Now, somebody pointed out to him, the Smith case happened to involve factually uh, members of the Native American church who were not given an exemption from the 
general a neutral law that banned the use of certain controlled substances. It didn't deliberately uh, single out peyote, but it didn't make an exemption. And, and somebody pointed out to Scalia, well, but that same principle that you've endorsed now would allow Congress or it would allow Oregon or any other state to pass a statute that uh, made prohibition of, of drinking alcohol uh, a crime. And, and, and that would mean that you couldn't do, you would, the Catholic Church would not be entitled to an exemption for drinking wine uh, in the mass. And, and Scalia um, thinks about it and he says, well, you know, it's true they could pass that law, but they would go straight to hell if they did. <laughs> <laughs> And I, you know, he obviously was a person of such great humor. I, I think of him smiling, uh, not from hell, but from somewhere else. Uh, as I think about the, uh, in some strange sense, he has been vindicated in terms of the liberal change of position on Smith, uh, just because of how, how the chips have, have fallen. Um, you now, and it was such a bitterly, opposed decision. Michael wrote very scholarly, uh, originalist critiques. Um, I testified in Congress, the House and the Senate, along and with just an unprecedentedly diverse group of um, advocates from every religion under the sun and the civil liberties community advocating a legislative fix, which became known as RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Uh, I remember testifying the Senate Judiciary Committee, and you know there was a cheering squad of Orrin Hatch and Ted Kennedy. I mean, there were, and and my panel, uh, I testified together with the head of the National Association of Evangelicals, and we were hugging each other afterwards. And you know, it was such strange bedfellows. But I think in some ways, um, I still continue to believe that that decision was wrong, and I still support RIFRA, but the um, the liberal company there is getting a little bit thin, and, and Eugene has written about this uh, as well as um, uh, some uh, advocates and to some extent courts are uh, allowing religious exemptions that of types that were not envisioned uh, in the factual circumstances at the time, but I still think as uh, neutral principles uh, that Scalia was, was wrong about that, but he might be amused that even the ACLU, which was one of the original uh, coalition builders to enact RIFRA, uh, has, has disendorsed it. Uh, I, uh, yours truly has not disendorsed it, but as I say, I'm uh, a small minority now. So he's getting the last laugh on that, I think. Okay, thank you, Nadine. The Second Amendment came into view in a major way during Justice Scalia's tenure on the court. Professor Volokh, how do you see Justice Scalia's impact in this area? Well, impact, of course, was huge, partly because he wrote the majority opinion, a five to four majority opinion uh, in Heller on the Second Amendment, but partly because if you look at both the majority and the dissent, they're all originalist opinions. And one of the things that, that, that's, the, that's the greatest kind of victory, when even people who don't agree with you and who reach opposite results from you on the merits of applying originalism are applying originalism, because that's, that's kind of how you have changed the debate. Um, uh, I think that there also was a particularly, uh, a, a place where originalism kind of showed itself to be to be kind of the, uh, the strongest, uh, not just in terms of the, the bottom line result. In fact, you can actually make a good argument that under a living constitution model, where living constitution means updating the constitution in light of public sentiment, as opposed to in light of just what the justices happen to prefer, under the living constitution model, the individual rights view would be even more appealing, looking at the polls, looking at state constitutions, looking at the judgments of Congress and the president and such. Uh, but, uh, but beyond that, it, if you had to give an example of something where originalism seems to make the most sense, it's got to be a situation where you've got a constitutional provision that has not had this incrustation of precedent the way the First Amendment has, the way free speech, for example, has, and, the, and where 
you're sort of saying, what does the Constitution say about something? And if we care about what the Constitution says, we care about it, but as opposed to a, a care about abstract right or wrong, if we care about what the Constitution says, we care about it because somebody said it, because somebody enacted it as part of the Constitution. And it would be a strange thing if you were to look at the words they used and completely ignore the meaning that they understood and just based on some sort of linguistic puns decided to use modern meaning for those words as opposed to the one that, that was present at the time. So I think that was in a sense a triumph of originalism and even the dissenters, as I said, uh, maybe they deep down inside didn't like originalism still, but they found themselves using originalist arguments. But the other thing which I think is not much talked about, about Heller, but I think is really important as well, and you know, there are pluses and minuses to this, is that it's a reminder that Scalia was not just an originalist, he was a traditionalist. This has been brought up before. In other areas too, just as Scalia's view was original meaning trumps. But if original meaning is silent, as it often is on exceptions to protection, uh, then tradition is what matters. Uh, it, he, the way he articulated is the traditions become part of the constitutional meaning just because traditions would not generally arise that are contrary to the original understanding. That's one thing, maybe a little bit of a historical fiction. But beyond that, I think he thought that that itself, being a good Burkean, the tradition itself had weight uh, that justices had to, uh, had to consider. That was obviously so with regard to his substantive due process jurisprudence, where he said if there is such a thing as substantive due process, it has to be limited to traditionally recognized rights. It was so as to free speech, where, for example, he was willing to allow um, government employers to engage in patronage hiring, even though that did impose a burden on people's associational rights to associate with the other party, because he said this was such a big part of American tradition. Uh, and the same thing was very much so in the Second Amendment. So some people say, well, where does, why is it that the Heller opinion says, well, it's okay to ban gun possession by felons. It's okay to ban concealed carry, uh, where if you look at the original meaning, there's no real evidence of original meaning one way or the other on that. And Scalia had a clear answer. He said it's tradition. He didn't go into all of the details, but it was clear to anybody familiar with his jurisprudence that this was tying into his general belief in tradition. Now, there's an interesting argument to be made for the proposition that he got the tradition not quite right as to felon and possession statutes, which are relatively recent, the date back to the 1930s, pretty much, and in the broader sense, only the, excuse me, in, 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 the, in the, the broader statutes, uh, date back only really to the 1960s. Uh, and maybe it's a, it highlights that perhaps tradition is not clear enough to uh, engage in the constraining function that Justice Scalia was constantly looking for, constraining of judicial discretion. Uh, but I do think that Heller was an example of the victory, uh, for, among nine justices, the victory of his originalist approach, even if there was, there was split 5-4 in the result, and for the majority also, uh, his uh, uh, sense that tradition itself is a way of liquidating, a way of, uh, of uh, uh, establishing the meaning of clauses as to those things in which original meaning is silent. Thanks, Eugene. Uh, Justice Scalia's decisions in the criminal law area were surprising to many observers, as has already been mentioned. And he had significant influence in shaping the court's doctrine in several areas of criminal procedure. Justice Straws, in which areas did Justice Scalia have the most impact in your view? Well, you know, in many ways, I feel like I grew up with Justice Scalia. Of course, I don't mean that literally. I mean that figuratively. He was quite a bit older than I am. But um, I went to school in, in law school in the mid to late 1990s. And by then, Justice Scalia had established himself on the court and had started writing uh, opinions that I read in my required criminal procedure class, um, which was required at my law school. And, you know, I was profoundly impacted by that court of sort of the early to mid-1990s and the jurisprudence, the sort of post-Warren Court jurisprudence uh, that came out, of which Scalia uh, was a tremendous part. And over time, um, Justice Scalia, I think, sort of expanded his impact uh, in the criminal justice area. I don't know whether it was um, him becoming more 
uh, comfortable with some of the areas where he had ventured before in other cases, or uh, whether um, he was assigned some of these opinions when he wasn't assigned them early in his career. But there's several areas, and I'm going to highlight three of them. Um, one area that I think is often o uh, uh, overlooked, uh, but definitely is sort of uh, tied closely um, to a statutory interpretation in the criminal area, is sort of the rule of lenity um, and due process area. Um, there was a case that came out of Minnesota re fairly recently, a case called Johnson versus United States, um, that dealt with the Armed Career Criminal Act and whether a short-barreled shotgun um, led to essentially an aggravated sentence under that particular statute. Now, the court had been struggling with this. They had decided, I think, a series of four cases and been struggling with that area for a long time. And Justice Scalia, after, after the court uh, ordered re-argument in the case, finally wrote an opinion in which he said, look, we've been struggling with this for a long time. I think that this particular provision, the, resi the residual clause, is void for vagueness, and he struck it down. Now, what's fascinating about that is um, Justice Thomas would have reached the same result, but on very different grounds. In his opinion, he said he would have employed ordinary canons of statutory construction, um, and that we, he would have applied the rule of lenity, something that Justice Scalia actually felt quite passionately about. Um, he was sort of a dissenter from the idea that the rule of lenity should be a last resort. And so I think that his sort of uh, impact in this area of the law, and I think there's one theme that comes out of this, which is he really held the legislature to a very high standard, which is to say that in the criminal area, he wanted, if, if, the, if the legislature the Congress was going to make something a crime, he wanted the Congress to be clear about it. And so you see that in his rule of lenity jurisprudence, you see that um, in his due process jurisprudence in the Johnson case, um, and I think he had a profound impact on other members of the court. You know, other areas that I think uh, are quite important and actually may, quite frankly, be hanging a little bit by a string are um, the Confrontation Clause um, jurisprudence um, and the right to a jury trial jurisprudence, um, sometimes called the Apprendi Five or the Crawford Five. Um, both of those areas have often been held together, and his viewpoint has often been held together by just five votes, the bare minimum. Of course, we've seen some cases that have had seven or eight votes in those areas. Um, but as you know, Justice Scalia uh, wrote the decision in Crawford, a very important case, um, that returned the Confrontation Clause to sort of its original roots um, about testimony uh, at trial. And it said, look, if you're going to take outside, uh, uh, you know, outside comments um, and they're in the nature of testimony and they're a substitute for testimony, uh, you need to follow the Confrontation Clause and give the defendant uh, a chance to cross-examine uh, cross that particular person. If you don't, it's, it's inadmissible. Um, you already saw, and what's interesting about that is, is he wrote a later case called Davis with the emergency exception. And then after that, you had Michigan versus Bryant, an opinion written by Justice Sotomayor, and you already saw a little bit of chipping away at his Confrontation Clause jurisprudence, where she expanded the emergency exception far beyond, I think, what he intended in the Davis case. And in fact, he dissented uh, in that case. And so I think Crawford and, and sort of the Confrontation Clause area is, is an area that's sort of hanging by a thread. Um, but it's an important, uh, important part of his uh, jurisprudence. The final area I want to talk about is um, one that I see a whole lot as a state court judge, and that's the right to a jury trial. Um, you know, I think a lot of us were surprised uh, when Apprendi was decided in 1999. It was a really important decision. Um, it's led to a whole line of case law. Uh, Blakely is probably the one that's most relevant to me on a day-to-day -day basis um, because that dealt with a state statute. Um, but again, he, he returned along the way, he returned um, the right to a jury trial right back to its sort of common law originalist roots. Um, and I think that was an important development. I think he viewed um, uh, judges, Congress, et cetera, um, you know, as, as um, in other words, I think, he, I think what he, his view really was, and, and, and it, 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 it was formed by this, was that he, you know, he didn't want to allow uh, uh, enhancements to a sentence without having the jury uh, uh, consider those enhancements and treat it like any other element of the offense. Um, and so, again, I think that that's an area uh, that he felt quite strongly about. It's an important area uh, in his jurisprudence. And, you know, we're, we're short on time, so I didn't get to cover his Fourth Amendment jurisprudence, which I also think is quite fascinating and important. Um, but I think that 
um, particularly his opinions over the last 15 to 20 years, um, are going to have a profound influence going forward uh, in a whole host of areas. And I just really just selected the ones that I thought uh, most people would be familiar with. But there's certainly a lot of obscure areas of the law, um, things that don't come up very much, where he also had a profound impact in the criminal law and criminal uh, procedure area. Um, and so, um, you know, I think back to those law school days, and, and I really grew up with sort of a steady diet of Justice Scalia, and I, I'm better for it, having read those opinions. Thank you, Justice. Of course, uh, you can't get into court unless you have standing. Justice Scalia had some notable thoughts on Article 3. Ed, uh, how do you think Justice Scalia shaped uh -huh. the law of standing? Well, thank you, Judge. Uh, before I turn to that topic, I want to note that Justice Scalia took his seat on the Supreme Court on September 26, 1986, the exact same day on which Judge O'Scanlan took his seat on the Ninth Circuit. That's, right. wow. That's true. Thank you. Thank you. Judge O'Scanlan was not only a dear friend of Justice Scalia, he was a, uh, a great judge in his own right. Uh, this last, this past September 26th, he announced he was taking senior status after 30 years uh, on the bench without hardship pay. Uh, so thank you very much, Judge. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. As in so many areas of the law, Justice Scalia had thought long and hard about standing doctrine before he joined the Supreme Court. In 1983, during his first year as a DC Circuit Judge, he spelled out his views at length in a speech turned law review article titled, The Doctrine of Standing as an Essential Element of the Separation of Powers. As his title makes clear, Justice Scalia maintained that a sound understanding of the constitutional limits on standing is necessary to confine the courts to their proper realm and to, pre and to prevent what he called and over judicialization of the processes of self-governance. He surveyed the wreckage of then existing standing rules, uh, cases in which who the plaintiff was or why the plaintiff was there wouldn't even be addressed by the court. He emphasized that courts needed to give renewed attention to the traditional requirement that the plaintiff's injury be a particularized one, which sets him apart from the, from the citizenry at large. In order to have st standing, he explained in that Law Review article, a plaintiff must have suffered concrete injury of the sort that the law being invoked was specifically designed to avoid. Traditional standing doctrine, he argued, restricts courts to their traditional undemocratic role of protecting individuals and minorities against impositions of the majority and excludes them from the even more undemocratic role of prescribing how the other two branches should function in order to serve the interests of the majority itself. He pointed out that uh, expansive views of standing in environmental cases tended to favor the uh, views of uh, uh, Cambridge and New Haven law professors over those uh, factory workers uh, in Detroit and miners, uh, coal miners in West Virginia. Now, if much of this uh, now sounds rather familiar, that's because early in his tenure on the court, Justice Scalia wrote the landmark majority opinion in Lujan be defenders of wildlife. In that opinion, uh, the court ruled that the irreducible constitutional minimum of standing contains three elements, the first of which is that the plaintiff must have suffered an, an injury in fact, that is an invasion of a legally protected interest which is concrete and particularized uh, and actual or imminent, not conjectural or hypothetical. Uh, under the components that he spelled out there, uh, the court in Lujan ruled that defenders of wildlife did not have standing to challenge an Interior Department regulation that the consultation requirement of the Endangered Species Act did not apply to actions taken overseas. The group's standing claim rested on the allegations that one of its members hoped to observe the Nile crocodile uh, and that another hoped to visit Sri Lanka sometime in order to see an elephant or leopard. Uh, a second large separation of powers point that then Judge Scalia made in his 1983 article cut in favor of standing. He argued that the entire concept of judicially self-imposed so-called prudential limits on standing was incoherent. What authority do the federal courts have, he asked, to grant or deny standing as their sense of prudence might dictate? 
Instead, he argued, the courts must always, in cases, of course, in which other justiciability requirements are met, must always hear the case of a litigant who asserts the violation of a, le of a legal right. And that the various prudential factors should instead be reconceived as bearing on the question whether such a legal right exists. Well, it took quite a bit longer until near the end of his tenure on the court for the court to adopt his rejection of prudential standing. But in his unanimous opinion, in 2014, in Lexmark v. Static Control, the court did exactly that. Prudential standing, he wrote in, in that opinion, is a misleading label. And although the court had placed the zone of interest test under the prudential rubric in the past, it doesn't belong there. Whether a plaintiff comes within the zone of interest instead requires the court to determine whether the plaintiff has a legal right that it is seeking to enforce. Now, in terms of the broader legacy uh, of Justice Scalia on this issue, as on so many others, um, obviously so much depends on the uh, future composition of the court, a prospect that I'm much more hopeful about now than I was, say, two weeks ago. Um, uh, it, it, I think it's fair to say that uh, even, over, even since Lujan, uh, the, the manner in which that test has been applied has been subject to competing views, and Justice Scalia was often, uh, in some big cases, in dissent on that, and lower courts, uh, have been all over the place. We had a ruling last week, I believe, from an o Oregon district judge uh, according standing to uh, uh, minors, not coal miners, but, but kids 9 to 17, who claimed a, a constitutional right to a sustainable uh, environment. And on that basis, uh, we're basically asking that the entire environmental policy of the United States be put under the supervision of this particular judge who readily complied with that request. <laughs> Uh, again, so much uh, depends on the future composition of the court. I will say that here, I think Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Scalia are very much um, aligned in their views on standing. Uh, I'll also note, though, that I think there's a division um, on, um, among folks in this room, uh, among conservatives and, and libertarians, roughly perhaps tracking the conservative-libertarian divide, but not necessarily uh, over those who would take uh, the more restrictive views of standing that Justice Scalia favored and those uh, who uh, would have a much more permissive view. Well, now, th thank you, Ed. Now that we've gotten a look at some of the specific areas of law that Justice Scalia significantly influenced, I want to ask a broader question. Eugene mentioned this uh, in passing, but uh, to what extent did Justice Scalia's focus on textualism and originalism drive the opinions that each of you uh, focused upon. Which, as between textualism and originalism and his contributions to those two areas, will have the most lasting effect? Do you want to start, uh, Floyd, perhaps? Yes. I think that the focus by Justice Scalia on text was likely to have more impact with respect to statutes than the Constitution. Um, the First Amendment doesn't really tell you a whole lot uh, about uh, what it is uh, that Congress can't do uh, with respect to algorithms uh, or with respect to uh, a variety of newer th issues which come up, uh, uh, you, you, you can't tease out of the uh, framers uh, what they would think about a, a pretty wide range of, of uh, issues, uh, at, at least in the First Amendment area, except the broad proposition that uh, there are a lot of things that they've government, qua government can't do. Congress, later the president, later the state, <coughs> uh, that, that all these things are, that, I mean, that's the starting point. Um, now, even that is a big, uh, has become a matter of uh, significant dispute on the court. More, li more liberal members of the court, Justice Breyer in particular, uh, ha has argued repeatedly that, uh, that, that the First Amendment is not just a limitation on government, that the purpose of it all is to assure a better informed public uh, 
uh, and that that being so, uh, statutes that do so are more likely to be deemed constitutional or the like. I, I disagree with all that, but the, the important part of that is just that where Justice Scalia began and ended with respect to the First Amendment is that its core, its, its central uh, lesson was that government couldn't interfere with, oversee too closely, ban, uh, uh, punish, uh, speech that leaves a lot of issues open uh, which are not decided by text alone uh, unless you uh, believe with Justice Black that Congress shall make no law means Congress shall make no law which even Justice Black didn't believe uh, uh, in some of the cases that came before him. Uh, so in the constitutional area and I think it's more generally true I mean there's a limit to how much we can depend upon the framers in terms of the language that they chose. Uh, on the statutory side, though, uh, Justice Scalia created a new, a new world, one which rejects legislative history, uh, disdains, indeed, legislative history, uh, and uh, not, let alone the, uh, the internal uh, portions of legislative history such as congressional reports and the like, which he knew well from his days, uh, were you know, drafted together, uh, I would argue, as part of, negotiated part of legislative history, uh, but, but had often little to do with the language that Congress chose, and he was very strong on that. <laughs> I think one of the most important contributions or changes in the law that, that he personally affected was the, the rejection of deviating from the language of Congress into what Congress must have meant if you look deeply into the legislative history. Mm -hmm. Judge? Um, so why will some opinions by Justice Scalia or others have more, la why do some opinions last and others not? Uh, it, it, it's not because I, it, it's not the ones that I agree with that are going to last, even though that would be a really good uh, rule of thumb uh, for the future to bear in mind. Uh, it's, uh, it's whether they're persuasive. And so I teach at a law school and I teach a lot of opinions and I can tell you uh, that, uh, you know, most of, most of my students come in thinking, that they won't agree with Justice Scalia on very much. You know, that, I don't mean all of them, but that's the predominant view. Uh, but they also come out of the class uh, being surprised by how often it is Justice Scalia's opinion that made the most sense and that they found the most logically uh, persuasive. And the area in which, since your question is that area, is the area in which I think this is most common is a separation of powers, the structural features of the, uh, of the federal government. And by the way, it isn't even necessarily his majority opinions. Mm -hmm. His dissents are among the most persuasive writings on the subject of separation of powers, and they are going to have staying power, and the majority is not, uh, because it, in, in the end, it's persuasiveness that really it really counts. So his dissent in Morrison against Olson, it just carries weight. Year after year, students will read that and they'll say, that has to be right. His dissent in Mastretta is a very persuasive opinion. His dissent in the line item veto, New York, New York against uh, uh, Clinton is, uh, is, uh, is, it's just right. And when students see this, uh, they're persuaded, and I think it's those, it's, it's the persuasive opinions like that that are going to be with us, and many of them in the separation of powers uh, area. So the question uh, in uh, freedom of speech and religious freedom, to what extent Scalia's opinions reflected textualism to what extent they reflected originalism. Uh, Michael and I were actually on another panel um, that talked about this yesterday with respect to freedom of speech and 
Uh, I discovered in preparing for that panel that there's actually this whole uh, field called judicial politics scholarship. It sounds a little bit like an oxymoron, uh, but there are scholars who have extensively analyzed, uh, in this case, uh, Scalia's opinions about freedom of speech, and interestingly enough, they also analyzed uh, Justice Thomas's and Justice Brennan's. It, uh, the article concluded its research in 2010, so it was every free speech opinion that Brennan had written and the ones that Thomas and Scalia had written through 2010. And, and what was really surprising, and I think um, this probably goes to illustrate a point that Eugene made, how uh, influential Scalia was in persuading even justices who were not favorably disposed toward originalism, which is an understatement when it comes to Justice Brennan, because in recent history, when the I advocacy of originalism as a method of interpretation was first broached by then Attorney General Ed Meese, uh, Brennan took the extraordinary step of uh, sitting Supreme Court justice, engaging in what Meese had propelled into the public forum as a matter of debate that was having enormous policy implications in terms of, of pending cases, and, and Brennan was a very outspoken opponent. Yet, what this study shows is that um, by the time he left the court, he was actually using originalism in his free speech cases at a significantly higher rate than Justice Scalia. Uh, so Brennan was using it more than one would expect, and as exponents, both uh, Scalia and Thomas were using it less than one would expect. I happen to remember the numbers. Uh, Brennan used originalism in 20% of his free speech cases, Scalia only in 17% of his, and Thomas in 29% of his, also in this bo forthcoming book by David Dorson that I mentioned in an interview that Dorson had with Scalia. Scalia said he realized that he was not using originalism in, in most of his free speech opinions. He did not give a reason as to why that was. The authors could not find um, any pattern to explain why it was used in some cases and not used in other cases. Um, they did find one pattern, which is in all of Scalia's cases involving the electoral process, including the campaign finance cases, uh, the anonymous, anonymous speech cases in campaigning, uh, and so forth. Every single one of those did use originalism, and the author's hypothesis was that uh, because that there was more, perhaps there was more historical originalist material available with respect to the classic political speech that's at issue in those cases, and. Also, they said in general, originalism tends to be used as a legitimating or reinforcing factor in cases where the court is deeply split. And in all of those cases, the court uh, was split five to four. Okay. Yeah, uh, there's no doubt that Justice Scalia was tremendously influential, but even with the most influential uh, of, of judges, the world influenced him and the world of judging the world of Supreme Court case law. I think it's unsurprising that free speech cases ended up not being tremendously uh, originalist, in large part because there was such a body of precedent, a body of precedent that was not tremendously controversial. Uh, and that body of precedent is a hard thing to dislodge. It's a hard thing to dislodge even from one's own mind, even if one wishes to. Uh, maybe it just makes it less likely one would wish to. Uh, so it's unsurprising, I think, that free speech cases, there wasn't that much of a focus on originalism because there was very little call to go back to first principles, the kind of thing that leads one to ask, what should those first principles be? Oh, let's look at the text, let's look at the original meaning. Uh, so, so I think Justice Scalia's opinions in free speech cases are going to be very influential, but they're going to be influential for reasons unrelated. <coughs> His, what we think of as his broader contributions to constitutional methodology. I think Justice Scalia's free exercise clause case uh, opinions are going to be tremendously influential, chiefly employment division versus Smith, but also for reasons unrelated to original meaning. Um, 
uh, um, Professor McConnell, I think, has uh, rightly criticized the Employment Div Division versus Smith decision for not talking about original meaning at all. And I think in part because of that, Justice Scalia and his concurrence in the city of Bernie versus Flores came back to defend his uh, position on originalist grounds. And there's still a, a, a debate as to whether that defense was or was not sound. And as you might gather, it's a complicated historical debate turning on the uh, significance of particulars, somewhat ambiguous evidence. But what really, I think, was influential in Employment Division versus Smith is another strand of Justice Scalia's philosophy, which is the rule of law is law of rules. That I think if you read Employment Division versus Smith, it's clear that what Justice Scalia was, refer was reacting to is the sense that, the correct sense, that the, um, uh, in my view, that the Free Exercise Clause Clause case law gave justices of sort of this roving commission to decide when an exemption should be granted and when not, and the ostensible test of strict scrutiny was really very difficult to figure out what, if anything, that meant other than, well, we think that these particular claimants with their particular religion and this particular law for our particular reasons ought to be entitled to this exemption. And I think one reason why Justice Scalia will be influential that, in part because uh, political tides have turned and, and the left has joined him, in a way that Justice Stevens was with him uh, at the time, but, but uh, virtually nobody else was. But apart from that, it's just, it's a simple, clear rule uh, that judges appreciate because it's a simple, clear rule. It creates a backdrop against which others can come up with things like RIFRA and state-level RIFRAs and such, uh, which the courts can then even apply. The interesting thing is the Supreme Court has applied the, RIF, the Federal Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which was enacted to kind of reverse the court's decision in Employment Division versus Smith. It applied it more forcefully than it ever applied the Free Exercise Clause during the pre-Smith era, in part because the rhetoric of the, of the RIFRA isn't we're going to trump the legislative will through judicially created exemptions, but rather we're going to implement the legislative will through judicially created exemptions. So by channeling that kind of the movement for religious exemptions in, in the, the direction of these statutes, which to be sure are present in only in, in um, between state constitutional provisions, state statutes, and a bit more than half the states, but not all. But that, I think, will be an enduring legacy of Justice Scalia for reasons quite unrelated to original meaning, even if you think you can defend them in original meaning. And the last thing is on the Establishment Clause. Uh, I, it, whether or not Justice Scalia's legacy will endure and will be broadened does depend on the personnel of the court uh, in large measure. But I think also in many ways, to the extent that it will prevail, it will pre prevail because he has come up with a relatively simple, straightforward rule of e even-handed aid programs may include religious institutions pretty much in an equal footing. That's an oversimplification, but not vastly so to replace a rule that everybody agreed was an incoherent mess. And again, whether one thinks that's consistent with original meaning, I think, it, I think it is, but whether or not one thinks so, that too is ultimately going to prevail, partly because of the personnel of the court and how they've been influenced, but partly again for rule of law and cl legal clarity reasons. Justice, how do you see textualism and originalism in your area of criminal law? You know, that's a tough question. Um, you know, it, it's tough because of the nexus between the, the interpretive um, task that he had in a lot of these criminal law <coughs> cases and the underlying constitutional principles. There's such a close connection between them. But, you know, I expect the attorneys before me to answer my question, so I'm going to answer the question and take a leap here, <laughs> which is I'm going to say I'm going to say the constitutional law side of things. And, you know, about uh, three months before Justice Scalia passed away, he was in Minnesota giving a speech at the, at the University of Minnesota, and I had breakfast with him the morning after his speech, and um, we were talking about criminal law. I used to be a criminal law teacher, and, and he said, we were talking about, I had clerked for Justice Thomas, and he, he sort of reverted back to what he, 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 says, he said publicly, which is, you know, Justice Thomas is a really solid originalist. I'm a bit of a weak kneed originalist. And I think it's because of his fidelity to stare decisis is largely why he says that. But I think that he undersells himself substantially. And I think that one of the areas in which he does that is the Fourth Amendment, the area I didn't get to talk about, which is um, if you look at the Fourth Amendment, um, he reaches a lot of conclusions that probably are not all that consistent uh, with his view of the world. Kylo, um, you know, Maryland versus King, uh, the swabbing of the inside of the cheek. Um, he was the sole sort of, and I use this loosely because I don't like this characterization, conservative member of the court, um, and he wrote the principal dissent uh, saying that that was an illegal search. Um, and then you go over to the other side, the remedy side, which 
Um, he also employed, I think, very robust uh, originalist methodology. Um, so he often called into question the exclusionary rule and did it over and over again. In fact, Warren Kerr wrote a post about this saying that he thinks that the exclusionary rule uh, may well be safe um, going forward. And so um, I, think that, I think that at every level on his Fourth Amendment jurisprudence, even in, in situations in which he was probably not that excited about the policy outcome or the outcome of the case he was deciding, I think he was, he was solidly originalist. And I think that that, um, that sort of uh, taking the cases and, and deciding in them consistently and in a principled way consistent with his methodology is something that um, I think is he's going to have a lasting impact not only on the judiciary, um, but law students uh, for many decades to come. Ed, how do you see that in the standing area? Well, I think if one looks at Justice Scalia's opinion in, in Lujan, uh, the basic understanding of standing is ultimately rooted in Article III's concept of judicial power and, and cases and controversies. Obviously, those terms don't spell out a lot, and I think that uh, you know, his opinion there has been criticized by some for not uh, really developing the originalist basis for these limitations uh, on standing. I will say, in fairness to him, uh, there was very little in the way of originalist briefing uh, back in 1991 and 1992 in cases. Uh, also, I will note that despite some academic criticism of uh, his opinion there, others have defended it as consistent with the um, original understanding of the judicial power. Uh, Ann Wolhander and Caleb Nelson co-authored a piece to that effect, and there is some obscure lawyer named John Roberts who, uh, in 1993, wrote a law review article uh, uh, defending Lujan. I think uh, beyond that, Justice Scalia, as he showed in Morrison versus Olson, had a real deep understanding of what really flows from separation of powers, uh, from the, uh, the assignment of distinct powers to the legislative, executive, and, and judicial branches. And I think his, uh, under his uh, understanding of standing is very consistent uh, with that. Can I ask, uh, did John Roberts' article, what, what did it say about the influence of Kant? Kant and Bulgarian evidence law. <laughs> uh, there, there's a footnote that addressed that. Okay, so it was a good kind of law review article, yes. right? Oh, good, good. <laughs> okay. Well, before we turn it over to the audience for questions, um, let's give our panel members a chance to make a case. <coughs> well, we'll get to that. <laughs> you ready for us to go? One, one final, <laughs> one, one final, um, opportunity for our panel members to make a case for why your particular area that you discussed, whether it's uh, the religion clauses or standing or Second Amendment, whatever, why the, your particular area is the most profound change <laughs> and will be Scalia's most lasting legacy. <laughs> Anyone want to try that? Sure. Sure. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, but of course, I'm not going to say it's the most important. Uh, I, I will say that one of the most important things that has happened on the Supreme Court with respect to the First Amendment is that it has been adopted by conservatives, uh, led by Justice Scalia. That was not the case the day before yesterday when I was in law school. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was not the case for many years after I graduated from law school. Uh, I mean, scholars could write articles uh, with a high degree of accuracy saying uh, the First Amendment is a, an amendment of the left. It is, it is an amendment which has allowed socialists to speak. It has protected uh, people who wanted to oppose, uh, uh, at least it was cited by, uh, by uh, abolitionists. It, it's been cited through the ages uh, by more radical rather than less, more out of step rather than in step. Uh, and uh, it is only recently, and in my view, primarily led by Justice Scalia, that uh, uh, at, as well as the particular issues, to be sure, which have been before the court and which it has been more comfortable for more conservative people to, to sign on to very broad First Amendment uh, propositions. Uh, so, I, I mean, in, in the area of the First Amendment, 
Uh, I think that uh, Justice, Justice Scalia's leadership uh, of the more conservative members of the court in signing on to a very, very broad reading uh, of the First Amendment, which I will just say parenthetically, is not a necessary one if all one did was originalism. I mean, what, what does one to do with originalism? How does one use it uh, with respect to the First Amendment when uh, the uh, Sedition Act of 1798 was passed one year before the Bill of Rights was yeah. adopted? Yeah. I mean, you have yeah. to deal with that if all you're interested in is what the framers thought. Uh, far better, and Justice Scalia would agree with this, I believe, far better to use the language of the First Amendment rather than the thoughts of the people around uh, the uh, drafting uh, of, of it. So the, 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 the big First Amendment question, as I see it, for the future, and I must say now, particularly with a new administration and this new administration, is whether the conservative jurists on the court uh, will continue, particularly as there are more of them, to take broad First Amendment views, uh, which I think Justice Scalia would have joined uh, as they look at whatever may come before them uh, in this uh, new regime. Uh, so I don't think that there is any particular area of the law where uh, Justice Scalia is going to have had the biggest impact. It, the, what, the biggest impact has to do with a style of judging which it, 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 uh, this is so important, uh, and I think it has been, he has influenced people of the left just as much as people, or almost as much as people on the right in this, that uh, the judges are not a roving committee just to make things up, and uh, what they write needs to be write, written with clarity, uh, that fuzzy three or four part tests are no longer in vogue. What he just, I, I was gonna say mushy opinions, but his word for it is so much better than mine. Argle bargle. Jiggery pokery. It's a, in Apple sauce. Pokery. It's, it, and when you read, you know, the people that are ostensibly on the other side of the, of the aisle, like especially Elena Kagan uh, and her, uh, her opinions, she aspires to the same kind of analytical clarity that Nino Scalia uh, t taught us uh, that ju that's what judges should be doing, and it is a profound change. I was a law clerk at the, uh, you know, around 1980, and the style was uh, exactly the opposite. And I don't, I, I don't know. We'll, maybe we'll go back on that, but I don't think so. I think Scalia taught us all something really important about how to how to be a judge. Mm -hmm. And, and related mm -hmm. to what Michael said, uh, so many of the law students here probably grew up and certainly went to law school in an era where uh, the virtues of originalism as at least a method that you have to explore is just taken for granted. So uh, again, I was reminded as I was preparing for this conference how uh, very controversial and spurned it was when it was initially floated, at, you know, first, uh, uh, Mies wasn't the first one. Who was the first author who wrote, anyway, th um, there was a famous article. Bork, Bork. Uh, well, Bork and somebody, but Berger. anyway, it was basically considered an extreme fringe view. Oh, Mies, well, Berger. A burger, right, Raoul Burger. Mm -hmm. uh, and Mies tried to, and he had a great platform for trying to gain more traction, uh, but it, it was quickly shot out of the park uh, until Scalia came along and, uh, and, and uh, resurrected it. I saw, I hadn't known to whom this statement was, a quote, it was attributed, but I, I saw it attributed to Ronald Dworkin the great liberal uh, constitutional philosopher, jurisprudence, in 1997, commenting about Justice Scalia's influence. Um, he said, thanks to Scalia, we are all originalists now. And that the fact that you would have even a Brennan, even a Stevens speaking in that vein. But I would take what Michael says even beyond 
um, other lawyers, other judges, other law students. He had such an influence on public discourse. First of all, you know, by making it seem interesting. And uh, he spoke so much in, in all kinds of public forums, including the Federalist Society. And, uh, and, and he really lit a fire in the general public and political imagination about originalism and about constitutional interpretation. And, and for me, you know, that's, that's, that's music to my ears. It's not only supporting free speech, but it's supporting free speech and, and discussion and civic engagement at every level about the most important issues, constitutional law. So notwithstanding what uh, uh, Professor McConnell says, uh, I'm, I'm inclined to say my area totally wins. Yes, <laughs> Second Amendment. There was virtually no Second Amendment case law. To the extent that there was, it was from the Supreme Court, to the extent that there was, it seemed to, at least that was generally understood as reading the Second Amendment securing no individual right at all. And now after Heller, the Second Amendment does secure an individual right. Hard to get bigger ratio than going from zero to one. <laughs> okay. But then again, so let me present the uh, an opposite perspective, which is one that ties into some of the things that Justice Scalia had talked about. If you think about um, what the Second Amendment has been, not just under the lower court's quite narrow reading of Second Amendment protections since Heller, but even under the view that uh, was accept was expressed at times by uh, Justices Heller, or Justice uh, Scalia and Thomas in uh, in dissent uh, when they wanted the court to grant certain some cases. Even if you read the Second Amendment more in a more muscular way, the main protection for the right to bear arms remains not the Second Amendment. Certainly wasn't the Second Amendment. It's been the political process. For example, one, the one thing that's clear from Heller is that there is no right to concealed carry under the Second Amendment because of these historical reasons in the view of the court rightly or wrongly in Heller. And yet, from 1986, well before Heller, to now, the, America has changed from 10 states allowing people to carry concealed either without a license or with a license that's easily available to 40 states. That wasn't because of the Supreme Court. It wasn't largely because of state Supreme Court decisions with a very few exceptions. It was because of the political process. Uh, and at least for the foreseeable future, by and large, there are some exceptions in some states, but by and large, the political process is gonna do more for a right to bear arms protection than the constitutional process. Well, just as the political process is doing much more for religious exemptions than the constitutional process has since Smith, and probably had even before Smith, given the, ra the rather weak way in which free exercise rights were applied back then. And that is something that I think Justice Scalia might well welcome, that even though he did have undoubted influence, and possibly indirect influence on the political process in, re in reaffirming what was the dominant uh, popular view of the Second Amendment to securing at least some sort of individual right, ultimately the protection for that right, as for other rights, is in the first instance uh, consigned to, dem to democratic processes. Justice? You know, I agree with, uh, with Michael 100%, uh, so I'm there for you. Um, the, uh, I think, I think the, uh, the real impact of Justice Scalia is in the way he judged. Um, I once heard him joke that, um, that there was a case, and I don't know if he was exaggerating or not, but he said where the argument was, uh, since the legislative history is unclear, we're going to move on to the text and see what the text says. Um, and just and after he said that, I went back and I looked at some briefs in the early 1980s, and he wasn't that far off. Um, and with respect to the Constitution, you saw a similar thing in the late 70s and the early 80s, right? You go into these cases or these briefs, and people are arguing, you know, this 1942 case says this, this 1955 case says this, this 1977 case says this. Right? It wasn't, no one was citing or quoting the text of the constitutional provision in a lot of these briefs. All they were talking about was how, you know, the, the Supreme Court had interpreted, or the lower courts had interpreted those provisions over time. Now, you don't see briefs that don't at least quote the text of the constitutional provision or the text of the statute and start with the text of the statute. And so, you look at how he's fundamentally changed the court. I, 
I think it's hard to say that there's any impact greater than the impact he's had in the way he approaches judging, um, because it, it just sort of flows all across the board to all these different areas. Good. Well, I did not pick the topic of standing. I had it uh, imposed on me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I feel no duty to defend it as a leading candidate uh, for uh, Justice Scalia's legacy. Um, that said, I th think I see it as part of his uh, broader, deeper uh, thinking on the nature of the, of the judicial role, and that uh, indeed will be a great legacy. Now we'd like to open the floor to questions from the audience, and I ask you please just to say, state your name and affiliation, direct your question, and I emphasize the word question, to a specific member of the panel, and once again, questions only, no speeches. Right here in the front. I, I, it's going to be difficult for us to see with this bright light, but it... Judge it's John, it's John, John Eastman. Go ahead. Uh, my question is directed to Ed Whalen. And, uh, and you again are... John Eastman, Chapman University, and a senior Thank fellow you. at the Claremont Institute. And, and I want to push back on Justice Scalia's own grounds uh, on, on standing doctrine. It's easy to get out of case and controversy, causation, redressability, um, uh, all of those things. It's much more difficult to get out particularized injury. And the move that he did from, of that from a prudential standing to constitutional standing seems to run afoul of other texts like equity, the rule of equity. Do you see that reopening uh, in, in, in the wake of Justice Scalia's passing? Or are we going to broaden it to say ban shareholder derivative suits, which are also based on a notion that you don't need particularized injury? Well, John, uh, I'll just say that, again, I think it largely depends on uh, who fills the court. I think there, as, your, as your question and comment indicate, uh, there is a divide on the conservative side on standing issues. Um, I, uh, I'm not inclined to agree with your own take, but I'm uh, happy to explore it further. But um, again, so much will depend on uh, who the justices are. Next. S Steve Calabresi, Northwestern University. My question is for Judge McConnell and also for Ed Whalen. Um, Justice Scalia, in a famous Law Review article uh, in the early 90s, uh, wrote uh, a piece called Originalism, the Lesser Evil, and claimed he was a faint-hearted originalist rather than a strong-hearted originalist. But as all of you have argued, I think in practice, he became more and more originalist over time. And when I think of the cases that he thought might have been questionable as an original matter, but which he followed because they were precedent. The two key ones that stand out are Hans against Louisiana and the slaughterhouse cases. Uh, in cases like Casey, for example, the fact that the government had come to the court five times in the previous decade and asked the court to consider overruling Roe versus Wade, I think meant to him there was no precedential significance at all to, to Roe. I want to ask you whether he is Scalia isn't right in the following sense that the question of whether to follow a case for stare decisis reasons means balancing the costs imposed by the erroneous decision against the benefits to be achieved by overriding it. That inherently is a bit of a political question. When the government comes to the Supreme Court five times prior to Casey and says, hey, the costs of following Roe are not worth the benefits of overruling it, the court is obliged, I would think, to address the matter on the original meaning. In cases like Hans against well, Louisiana... I, I think there's a question there somewhere. <laughs> okay, I'll stop there. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, on the article, the originalism, the lesser uh, evil, uh, so the, the idea of that article, it's a functionalist explanation of why originalism uh, helps with the judicial role and so forth. Uh, but I, I believe that Justice Scalia had another ground for originalism and which actually appeals both to me and I think to perhaps to most original, a lot of originalists, which is that it isn't a functionalist definition. It has to do with, uh, with language and with democracy. That is, if it is true that the people have an original right uh, to 
uh, to govern themselves through a written constitution will last through the ages. It is what they understood they were doing that is authoritative. And that isn't because it constrains judges. We could constrain judges by saying, you know, uh, you know, throw the dice. That would constrain judges, but it wouldn't have anything to do with, with, uh, with democracy. So I think that's. I think he became less faint-hearted because he became more committed to originalism as a, uh, as a matter of fundamental democratic political uh, theory. Now. Uh, Story decisis is a. Oh, we should have a whole conference on how to, on how to. What, what are the right ways to, uh, to do this? Uh, can I give you my I, my own view? I don't really know if this would be Justice Scalia's view or not. Perhaps not. Yep. Uh, but my own view is this. I believe that the text is the most authoritative thing, and I believe that it's the text as historically understood. But I do believe. And I think Eugene probably put this best a little bit earlier, and, and Floyd was, uh, also, that isn't going to answer all of our questions, uh, partly because the world changes and throws up new things that, you know, that's hard to know how they'll fit in, and partly because there, there were differences, there were ranges of opinions at the time. And I believe that the role of both tradition, which I mean, by which I mean, a uh, reflection about constitutional principle outside of the courts and uh, precedent um, be become authoritative in guiding our decision making within the range of plausible meaning uh, left by the text and, and original meaning. So uh, it, when we get to a point where it's pretty clear that through the process of precedent we've arrived at a place which is contrary to what we supposedly are interpreting, uh, stare decisis should not keep us from, uh, uh, from a corrective measure. That's Crawford against Washington is a great example from Scalia's uh, 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 work uh, on that. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, there are many, you know, stare decisis has many virtues, but especially because within these ranges of plausible meaning, we need an answer to questions mm -hmm. that, that or we can't wring out of originalism. Could I just add to that? That, that I, I think Justice oh, Scalia's view yes. on cases that he thinks were seriously wrongly decided was that they should be reversed without weighing anything other than how strongly he felt about it. That was true about Roe versus Wade. It was true about a case that he told uh, me uh, and Nadine that same uh, evening, very important for us, not for him, uh, that, uh, that evening. Uh, I asked him, what, what, what's the worst case, worst decision since you've been on the bench? He said, McConnell versus FEC, the case I happened to lose. I didn't really lose it, but, but the, 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 the court got it wrong. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. But when those cases were, were, were going to come up again, I, I, I think we, we, we shouldn't make this sound as if it took that much thought. He knew what he thought about them. He thought they were terribly decided, indefensibly decided. And I don't think there was a cost-benefit analysis at all. The next question is going to come from the back, and I saw a hand raised. Thank you. Uh, please introduce yourself and ask the question. Uh, I am Francis Menton from New York City, Manhattan Contrarian website. Um, I want to ask about uh, an area of Scalia's jurisprudence that ha hasn't been addressed here, which is uh, the deference concept. Uh, for a guy who was so deeply into the separation of powers, cared about it so much, uh, wrote so much about it, and yet somehow he seems to have bought into this concept of deference to the administrative agencies in interpreting their statutes, which has always seemed to me like, number one, a complete abdication of the core judicial function of interpreting statutes, and number two, a complete roadmap to the administrative agencies ultimately to undo the separation of powers because every interpretation by an administrative agency of a statute is a seizure of more power unto itself every time. And your question is? And my question is, I would like, uh, uh, who, who would comment on this? I would think Mr. McConnell or maybe Mr. Volokh might have a comment on that. 
Well, you know, I have a comment on everything. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so you're, you're speaking principally of Chevron deference, the idea that, uh, that administrative agencies are entitled to deference within, if, if the statute isn't clear as to the meaning. This came about, I think, uh, you have to remember the 1980s, which is, uh, it, this is a 1983 decision, have to remember uh, what was going on, and what was going on is that the D.C. Circuit was, uh, was the master administrative agency for every <coughs> statute uh, in the entire book because what the D.C. Circuit would say is, first of all, they had purpose of interpretation, so it's the purpose of the statute that governs rather than its text. And we decide, anytime we think that a regulation doesn't serve the purpose that we think it serves, uh, we're going to substitute something else. Now, I was a lawyer in the Justice Department during this period. It was extremely frustrating uh, because the, the D.C. Circuit could just, I mean, it, it was like, why, have, why hold a presidential election uh, <laughs> if, uh, if, the, if, these, if the D.C. Circuit is going to be able to run the entire administrative state? And, and Scalia's insight here is that as between executive branch agencies and courts, the more democratic way of, of, of resolving these questions is executive agencies. Now, I believe that Justice Scalia was losing faith in Chevron deference toward the end, and I think two things have changed between the 1980s and today. The first thing that has changed is that as the executive branch became aware and really took in the idea that they had this Chevron deference power, uh, we moved from a world in which the executive branch had, re had really felt bound by the statute, and, and so they were interpreting the statute to, wow, we can say almost anything we want to about statutes. And then when you defer to it, the Congress really gets uh, a, a left out of the uh, of the matter, and so I I think that's really a, pr a principal uh, reason for the change, and so I, I think that Chevron is uh, is probably eventually going to be a product of its times and not uh, and and not something to govern us moving forward. Eugene, yeah. did you want to ask, answer uh, no. add anything? Okay, the uh, question from the front. So my question, hello, uh, my question is to Ed Whelan. Uh, it's about standing. Um, I, I definitely agree that Scalia should be lauded for strengthening standing in these statutory cases. But when I consider the Obama administration waiving statutes by blog post or spending money not appropriated by Congress or other constitutional problems, I, a lot of times I see standing, especially if they do it in such a way that no one's harmed, we're only going to benefit people. And standing can act as a way to say that the executive can act in a blatantly unconstitutional fashion. Which is leading to a that. question, I hope. What are your thoughts about standing <laughs> compared to statutory standing? Thank you. Uh, well, look, I think you're clearly right uh, that that can happen. Um, we saw, for example, with respect to the Defense of Marriage Act, the Department of Justice departing from its traditional standards on when it's going to defend a law. Uh, we saw Justice Scalia, in the Windsor opinion, saying that, uh, in his dissent, rather, uh, saying that the Justice Department's actions uh, eliminated the adverseness uh, necessary for a decision. Uh, so I think uh, part of his answer to that is, uh, would be that uh, when political actors act irresponsibly, at least we have uh, ultimately some political checks, but is that you know, fully satisfactory? No, but I think uh, Justice Scalia wasn't a utopian in his understanding of uh, the, the judicial role, and you know, some bad things are gonna happen. Uh, when, when, uh, when judges stick to their role, just as lots of bad things will happen when they don't. Back in the room, I can't, uh, gentlemen, I, I can't uh, see. Uh, Garrett Snedeker with the James Wilson Institute. Uh, bold question for the whole panel. Other than some aspects of his First and Fourth Amendment uh, absolute Im absolutism, would it be fair to characterize Scalia as a Holmesian-style majoritarian, and specifically per for Professor McConnell, was Scalia's decision in Smith an invitation to amend the rules under which we are governed by consent as firmly within the province of the legislature to remedy, not the judiciary, rather than Scalia providing guidance on uh, religious exercise within our constitutional republic. Joyce, you want to try that one first? Um, 
That's a really interesting question. I, I don't think that, I, I think it's too crude. Um, I think that Scalia did not, was neither a Holmesian statist on the one hand, nor a Randy Barnettian libertarian on the other. <laughs> uh, I think he paid attention to the texture of the Constitution, and the Constitution leaves a lot to the legislative branch, and it constrains the government in many ways, and I think you don't, I, I think he was attentive to that. He may not always have drawn the line exactly where any one of us would have drawn, and, and for me, Smith is an example of that, uh, but uh, I think that's the enterprise. So uh, rather than to generalize about, you know, whether we're Holmesians uh, or not, and you're, you know, you're perfect, you're, you're quite right about, uh, about Smith, what Smith does is it transferred the authority to accommodate uh, minority and dissenting views, religious views, uh, from the courts to the uh, to the uh, uh, political branches. And it's interesting the political branch, at least Congress, responds with RIFRA, and whoever was it, I think it was Eugene, is so right. RIFRA has proven in practice to be much ro more robust protection for religious exercise against federal law than uh, the free exercise clause ever was. And Scalia didn't object to that. It was, it, be, it got a democratic warrant. Again, I don't agree with the decision, but I think, you know, there's a, there certainly was a logic to it and it, and it, and it is much more democratic. Here in the front. <coughs> My name is James Stuchel. I'm a federal prosecutor in Georgia. My question is the 11th Amendment. The text of the amendment deprives a federal court of subject matter jurisdiction over a lawsuit filed by a citizen of one state against the government of another state. So a citizen of Virginia can't sue this, the government of West Virginia. But the Supreme Court's interpreted that very broadly to also include lawsuits of citizens of the state against the government of his, his own state. So my question is, given Justice Scalia's fealty to textualism, why did he sign on to such a broad interpretation of the 11th Amendment. Anyone? So, uh, <laughs> I think there's a misunderstanding here that all of these cases are 11th Amendment cases because the, what happened here is that uh, there was, there was a, the, 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 the supporters of the Constitution were very clear that states would not be able to be sued. Madison says this is the Virginia ratifying uh, convention. Hamilton uh, uh, says it. Uh, uh, James Wilson, for the person from the James Wilson yeah. Center, didn't say it. He took the opposite view of this. But uh, when, when the Supreme Court allowed George, the state of Georgia to be sued by a citizen of another state, it shocked everybody because but not because it was a citizen of another state. It shocked them because it went back on the idea of state so uh, sovereign immunity from suit. And so the 11th Amendment reverses the narrow holding of Chisholm, but it was the people's judgment that the Supreme Court was wrong to violate state sovereign immunity that actually prevailed, and that is the principle. It really isn't that the 11th Amendment is being applied it's that the 11th Amendment overruled the rationale of Chisholm versus Georgia and returns to a scheme in which the uh, state governments are not susceptible to suit. At least that's the logic, I think. Can I elaborate just briefly on that? I, I, I think, I, uh, think what, what Michael says is uh, quite right, but I think it's part of a broader point, which we have to keep in mind whenever we think about text. And this may be something where original meaning uh, goes a little bit beyond the text. I don't, the framers did, were writing against the backdrop of an existing system of law. They were quite self-consciously trying to change many aspects of this existing system of law, and the more structural it was, the more it was clear that they were creating a whole new government. There was no doubt about that. But there were all sorts of assumptions, there was all sorts of understandings that they had. We see that as to some rights provisions as to, for example, why uh, there is an enemy combatant essentially more or less exclusion from the general rules about, uh, uh, about jury trials and various other such things. My sense is, uh, I'm not a scholar of this, but I think that the court is pretty right in assuming that 
there was this general understanding of what the proper scope is of constitutional constraints and what things are extra constitutional perhaps in certain ways. Uh, and I think we can list that in virtually every area there were some background assumptions against which they were operating. So one question is to what extent do we say that those background assumptions themselves become a part of the constitutional framework? Uh, and uh, uh, the concept of state sovereignty and limits and state suitability may be just one of those things that, you know, they weren't thinking that the Constitution would be a comprehensive code, that it, literally everything written in it is sort of exclusive, at least within its own, uh, with its own textual zone. There are other principles, other understandings that maybe they didn't include just because they were so widely shared. Last two questions, the first will be from the back and then the uh, last will be from the front. The Joe last Co shall be first. Joe Cosby, I'm an uh, attorney in private practice in Washington, D.C. Um, when I was in law school, the prevailing orthodoxy was legal realism, which was commonly traced to an essay by Oliver Wendell Holmes. How would you compare, any one of you or all of you, how would you compare the influence of Oliver Wendell Holmes to Justice Scalia. Did, did, did anyone get the question? Would you mind repeating <coughs> the last part of the question? I didn't hear it. Perhaps others didn't. How do we compare the influence of um, Scalia to Oliver Wendell Holmes' legal realism? Oh, all right. Very well. Holmes Who would is like still to still ahead. <laughs> yeah, Holmes <laughs> is still ahead. <laughs> okay. The, the Chinese statesman Cho and Lai was asked uh, what he thought of the French Revolution, and his response was, it's, it's too soon to tell. <laughs> <laughs> Any others? Final question. Uh, thank you. Deirdre Holliman, I head the Washington office of a veteran service organization. Um, and I wanted to ask Mr. Abrams, uh, is it true what we hear that young people today neither really understand or cherish the First Amendment? And uh, what Professor uh, Stassen, when, uh, Mr. when the justice died, I was told by the head of Arlington National Cemetery that they were being bombarded with phone calls asking where he was being buried so that they could uh, go there. And that shows what you were saying, how important he was to the general public. Well, my answer is that the young people cherish it but don't understand it. <laughs> uh, uh, um, I mean, th there, are, there are generational differences uh, in terms of uh, how people approach uh, you know, broad articulations of human freedom uh, and the protection of that freedom. Uh, I think more recent polling data uh, indicates more of a willingness of, uh, for example, entering college students to certainly sign on to, say they agree with, say they think uh, First Amendment ought to be applied on their campus, except when people's feelings are hurt. <laughs> so, uh, we still have a major educational job to do. Very Thank well. Thank you. Well, as we end our program and this conference, we're paying tribute to Justice Scalia. I'd last like to ask each panelist to offer a final one-minute reflection on his life and legacy. Let's go in the order in which we began. Floyd? I, I have to conclude, I have to use 20 seconds of my 60 with a story. Uh, he and I are at an airport together. Uh, we're about to attend a conference in San Francisco or in New York. He gets on the plane. I'm not allowed on the plane because my ticket, they said, had been canceled. I said it hasn't been canceled. They said it had. Justice Scalia is standing in back of me. I'm arguing with the person. Justice Scalia whispers in my ear, I want to change your position about capital punishment? <laughs> so he'll, he'll be remembered for a lot of things. Uh, 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 and, uh, uh, you know, they're... 
you know, we all we all come and go, but the the, the the spirit and the words and the mode of analysis of Justice Scalia will will remain with us. Judge, um, all I can I mean, he was one of a kind. He'll be he is very seriously missed. I just want to say I've read a couple of essays, including one recent one by Erwin Chemerinsky, whom I admire and is a friend, but I disagree with him on, I understand where he's coming from and I want to have a rebuttal. So he says that Justice Scalia does use very intemperate, insulting language in his opinions and Erwin is concerned that that's leading, feeding into the incivility that unfortunately is becoming so rampant in our society. Uh, it's true that the opinions read that way, uh, many of them do, and, and, and come off as arrogant, but it is so completely opposite of how he was as a human being in his interactions with everyone, including people with whom he strongly disagreed, including with students, including with audience members, including with organizers of conferences. He was the most, he and I spoke together many times and you know, many big name speakers come in and they give their talk and then they, they leave. He stayed sitting in the front row through the whole event and he always explained to me, it was to show his respect to the people who worked so hard to put it together. He did the same thing answering every last student's question. Um, uh, and he, um, he did not only speak to the choir, he accepted my invitations to appear at ACLU national membership conferences. I mean, he was so generous and humane, and I'm sorry that that quality doesn't necessarily come through in the opinions, and I think it's important for those of us who did have the privilege of interacting with him in person uh, to make it clear that people understand that. Now, uh, I'm gonna end with um, the last letter I got from him because it's a love letter to this organization, really. Uh, he had been invited to do a debate against me by some organization, not the Federalist Society. Um, and he said, um, Dear Nadine, as attractive as is the opportunity to share the stage with you again, I'm gonna say no, I have to accept many invitations from organizations that have a special claim on me. And he lists three, Harvard, Chicago, and the Federalist Society. So um, I think it's clear that this group did have a very special claim on him. I was very moved by Lee's opening remarks to that effect. And um, it's wonderful that you are paying tribute to him in this way, and I'm so honored to have been a part of it. Eugene. Yeah, so we've heard a lot, and rightly so, about uh, Justice Scalia's uh, uh, influence in jurisprudence uh, and influence on particular particular areas of law. We've heard uh, about his qualities, his sterling qualities as a person. I want to just briefly touch on something we've talked a little bit about, but him as a writer. Um, one, of, he, uh, one of the things that is not as well known about him is he was one of the few lawyer members of the uh, American Heritage Dictionary Usage Panel. Uh, and if you ever talk to him about legal, uh, about writing, not just legal writing, writing, and of course if you look at his, uh, uh, at, um, his, his written work about persuading judges, you see how, it, uh, how con introspective uh, he was uh, uh, about language, about how, uh, maybe introspective is the wrong term, but how much he thought about language, how, how consciously uh, he, w uh, he thought about language. He obviously was a great user of language, but he was a great user and a great thinker about language. And he's a reminder that law is a rhetorical discipline, and that's something that I think we as law professors teach our, try to teach our students, is that you've got to have great ideas, and you certainly had those, but you've got to express them in ways that are clear and vivid ways that stick in the reader's mind. And one can debate about whether some of them may have been a little too rhetorical. I certainly tell my students, just because Justice Scalia can get away with it doesn't mean you can as lawyers. <laughs> but what he reminded us, and what will be, I think, one reason why he's so influential is if you write in a way that people pay attention to, that people remember, people are gonna be much more persuaded. And that's something that, uh, uh, that it is wise, I think, for a lot of law students and a lot of lawyers to remember. Justice? 
Yeah, so um, I want to focus on one thing that I'm sure came up at some point, but on it didn't come up in any panels that I attended, which is one of the things I appreciate, especially now that I'm in the role that I'm in, was Justice Scalia's honesty. Um, I mean, it, it really is refreshing uh, to see someone who tells you exactly what he or she thinks um, and that is honest about it, whether it's a popular decision or an unpopular decision. Look, judges have to make unpopular decisions. That's just the breaks of the game. And I appreciated his honesty, um, both personally. I mean, I didn't clerk for him, but personally in my interactions with him, but then also in his honesty and how he wrote his opinions, how he told you exactly what he was thinking and why he was doing the things um, that he was doing. And, 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 and so I really, that's one thing I take from him that I didn't necessarily hear mentioned, um, but I really appreciated his honesty. Judge, if you'll indulge me for an extra minute, uh, Nadine's mention of Erwin Chemerinsky compels me to pass along that Chemerinsky, Professor Chemerinsky tried to play the same etiquette card on me uh, at, at a panel of, of appellate judges last week. He trotted out his uh, frivolous argument that the Constitution imposes a duty on the Senate to hold a hearing, an up or down vote. Uh, on Supreme Court nominees, this from the very person who uh, supported the uh, filibuster of Justice Alito. And he objected uh, vigorously, uh, uh, took offense when I labeled his argument frivolous and silly. Uh, lo and behold, it turns out that uh, he routinely uses such terms in his own writing, and, and including the term obviously fatuous. Uh, so uh, he's going to try to play this card, and I, it shouldn't be uh, accepted, especially from him. I do want to add on this point, Justice Scalia treated others exactly as he would like to be treated. He, if, if he was going to make some sort of, uh, you know, uh, gobsmackingly stupid error, he would have a lot of people to say, don't you know what you're doing? Look at how, look at how bad this is. And I think to the very end, he, he hoped that somehow reason would win out with some of his colleagues. In terms of his legacy, or my one minute of thoughts on this, let me just uh, answer that this way. Uh, over the last three weeks, I've been involved with a whole series of events um, uh, on Justice Scalia's legacy. There's a beautiful ceremony at the Supreme Court uh, last Friday, uh, the memorial service there, followed by a uh, clerk's reunion in the evening. Uh, I think a lot of us uh, found real peace in uh, celebrating his legacy. At the same time, there's this real sense of mourning that there's a legacy that was soon going to be tossed behind. And the sense of unexpected elation that I felt on Tuesday evening, uh, uh, the hope that indeed we can build a Supreme Court uh, worthy of Justice Scalia uh, speaks to um, very much how I view him. Thank you. President Obama said, and I quote, Justice Scalia will no doubt be remembered as one of the most consequential judges and thinkers ever to serve on the Supreme Court, end quote. True words. We will miss him greatly. Thank you and thank all of our distinguished panelists. Thanks to the Federal Society and particularly to the staff. Let's give them a round of applause for a terrific conference. <laughs>